One of the emphatic teachings of the Bible is that all men who have ever lived will stand before the judgment bar of God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The judgment will be personal, it will be individual. Paul also writes in Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself unto God. The judgment will be fair. It will be accurate. We will stand before the judge of all the earth who knows things as they really are. You can't get to the judgment and think that you can pull the wool over God's eyes. You're not going to get to the judgment and think that God just wasn't up on everything that was going on. Listen to the words of Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. In Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31, Jesus pictured the judgment. He said, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And then the judgment will begin. I remember back in school as a youngster, one of our requirements was that we would take tests. Sometimes they would, these would be pot tests or tests which were unscheduled. That simply underscored the importance of making certain that we were prepared each day when we came to class. That underscored the importance of making certain that we did our homework each day and that we knew the material. Sometimes we made a bad grade on those tests, but we could pull our grades up. We would learn the lesson from that and we would study harder and make certain that we were prepared each day. But then when it came time for the final exam, if we had made a string of bad grades, it was too late to be concerned at that point in time. Because when it came time for report cards to be issued, then we could not go back and retake that exam or those tests. For just a few moments in this study, I would like for us to picture the judgment as your final exam. Picture in your mind's eye, if you can, standing before the judge of all the earth. Off in the distance, you see a great throne, a majestic throne, and you see a great throng of people, a great multitude of people, so massive that you've never seen anything like that before in your life. And then you're called before the judgment seat of Christ. And now you're going to give an account for the decisions that you've made, for the choices that you've made in life, for the life that you have lived. Let's go through and mention a number of areas and take a test, if you will. I've entitled this study, Pass or Fail. And with each particular point, think about it in your mind. Do you pass or fail? And remember, you know the answer, but then the Lord also knows the answer. Now, here's the good thing. When we get to the end of the study in just a few moments... If you have failed in all of these things, or maybe one of them, or two or three of them, then the good thing is you can do better. You can make correction. But when it comes time for you to stand before the Lord in judgment, it will be too late. So let's take this test. First of all, I have become a Christian. Do you pass or fail? I'm well aware that the world's definition of a Christian is much different from the definition that you find in the Word of God. If you ask the average individual today, what is a Christian? Some people would tell you that a Christian is a good moral person, a person who is an upstanding citizen in their community, just a good moral individual. You can ask someone else, what is a Christian? And they might tell you that a Christian is a religious person, a person who is a member of a church, any church, doesn't make any difference. 
As long as you're religious, then you are a Christian. Then there are others who would tell you that if you have asked the Lord to come into your heart, that if you have said the sinner's prayer, then you are a Christian. But what we are concerned about in this study is what does the Bible say? Now, if the Bible teaches all of these things that I've just mentioned, then we need to accept them without reservation whatsoever. But if those are mistaken ideas, if those are false ideas, then we need to reject them and take exactly what the Bible says. On the first Pentecost, following the resurrection of Christ, Peter and the other apostles preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. In this sermon, they let their hearers know that Jesus was the one who was the divine Son of God. He was who he claimed to be. Peter says in Acts 2 and 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by, you in the, by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Acts 2, 22 through 24. Well, how did those people accept that? What were their thoughts about that? We read in verse 37 that when they heard this, and the, it was about 3,000 of them, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter answered and said unto them in Acts 2 and verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Then we read in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them that same day about 3,000 souls. What happened on that day? They became Christians. They became Christians when they obeyed the inspired words that were spoken to them by the apostle Peter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. So the question is, how does one get into Christ? Let me refer you also to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul says that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. So the question is, how does an individual get into Christ? Paul answers that question in Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul, how do you get into Christ? You're baptized into Christ. That's what Scripture says. That's what Paul wrote by inspiration there in Galatians 3, 27. Now, if that's not enough, look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Paul, how do you get into Christ? You're baptized into Christ. Paul also writes that we're baptized into the death of Christ. Where did Jesus shed his blood? He shed his blood in his death. And so, when an individual is baptized into the death of Christ, it is there that the blood of Jesus is applied to the soul of the individual. And so, how does an individual become a Christian? Well, he hears the word, Romans 10, 17. He believes the word. He believes in Christ, John 8, 24. He confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is, he's confessing his faith in Christ. Romans 10, 10, Acts 8 and verse 37. And then he must enter into Christ. And that is through the action of baptism. <coughs> Pardon me. And so then, I have become a Christian. Do you pass or fail? But then secondly, I attend all services of the church. Do you pass or fail? You know, my friends, this is not a new problem. This was a problem that also existed in the first century. 
And we'll note that in just a moment. But when different members, and, and all across the brotherhood, there are members who think little or nothing of forsaking the different assemblies of the church. And we need more teaching on this. We need more preaching on this. But then again, we need more members, and especially those who are prone to forsake the assembly. We need more members to look at the scriptures and understand that the Lord meant what he said and said what he meant. Now, look at Hebrews 10 and 25. The writer says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so then, it is sinful to forsake the assembly. As a matter of fact, it is willful sin. The writer goes on to say in verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Why do you attend the services of the church? I don't know. It may help some of these brethren uh, if they have in the forefront of their mind the exact reason why they should be faithful in attendance. Well, first of all, we worship God. It is when we come together as a collective body of the Lord's people that we praise Him together. Note this. The writer says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. We come together to worship God to praise Him. But listen to this. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now my friends, that translates into loving God with the totality of our being. And if we love God that much, then we wouldn't even have to be discussing this. The same brethren would be present each assembly every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, whenever we have the opportunity to come together to worship and praise God. And so we come together to worship God. But not only that, we receive spiritual nourishment. Through our Bible classes, there's discussion and interaction as we discuss the Bible, as we talk about biblical passages and biblical uh, chapters. When the gospel is being preached, we have the opportunity to turn in the Word of God as the Bible is being preached and to look at the various scriptures which are cited. Not only that, but when we sing, Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, we are praising God. But then according to Paul in Colossians 3.16, we are also teaching and admonishing one another. Who among us does not need that? Who among us does not need to be taught to be admonished? If you love the Lord with your heart, soul, and mind, you'll be present for every assembly. And so then, I attend all services of the church. Do you pass or fail? But then thirdly, I pray regularly. Do you pass or fail? Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean that our lives are to be just one long continuous prayer, but prayer is to be as much a part of our spiritual lives as food is for our physical life, our physical bodies. We are to pray to the Lord. In, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, Peter says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. That encourages me to know that as a faithful child of God, I can go to the Lord in prayer, and he's listening to me, and he will answer my prayers. I'm praying in harmony with his word. Not everyone can pray, and we need to be aware of that. In Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9, the wise man said, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. David said in Psalm 66 and verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 
But then as I shun evil, as I overcome temptation and strive to live a righteous life, the Lord listens to my prayer. Oh, it is a vital part of our lives as Christians. And so I pray regularly. Do you pass or fail? But then, let's look at another one. I control my tongue. Do you pass or fail? I control my tongue. You know, many who would not dare be guilty of the vices that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and the, uh, the works of the flesh, of which we read in Galatians chapter 5, many who would not dare be guilty of those things are guilty regularly of misusing their tongues. Now, let me tell you something. Whether it is backbiting, lying, slander, gossiping, profanity, whatever it is, we need to see it as it is. These are sins of the tongue. And John writes about lying in Revelation 21, in verse 27, when he says, There shall in no wise enter into it, that is heaven, anything that worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. James writes about the overall misuse of the tongue in James chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. He says the tongue is a fire. It is an unruly evil. It is full of deadly poison. He said with the same tongue you bless God and curse men who are made after the likeness of God or in the image of God. He said, brethren, these things ought not so to be. We also find where Paul wrote about some who were tattlers and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 13. And even back in the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16, Moses was speaking to the children of Israel and he said, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. And the Lord hasn't changed his mind about that. Listen to this. Lest we think that the words that we speak will have absolutely no bearing in the judgment, we had better read Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37. Jesus said, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Our words are important. The way that we use our tongues is important. And so then I control my tongue. Do you pass or fail? But then finally, as we close out this study, think about this. I regularly try to lead someone to Christ. Do you pass or fail? I regular, regularly try to lead someone to Christ. Jesus came into the world for the express purpose of saving the souls of men. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save the souls of men. Jesus had a passion for souls. Jesus had a passion of trying to reach out to those who were lost. He said in John chapter 6 and verse 38, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And in John chapter 4 and verse 34, when the disciples were thinking about food because they were hungry, Jesus was so concerned for the lost, he was so zealous in trying to reach out to the lost that he was able to forget his own hunger. And he told them, my meat, my sustenance is to reach out to these, to do the Father's work, to accomplish his work. And that was the work of saving the lost. Jesus told the disciples in, in uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said in Matthew 28 and verse 19 in Matthew's account, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Why was it so important for them to go out and teach? 
Why was it so important for them to try and reach the lost, to try and save the souls of men? Because Paul writes in Romans 1 and 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel of Christ is the power that God uses to save the souls of men. And we are to be his instruments. And there's something that everyone can do. And we ought to be grateful for that. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and he was, he was writing there and comparing the body of Christ with the physical body. And he says, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Well, the point that he was making was that in the physical body, we have, there's one body, but there are many members. And each member has a specific function. The eyes can't do what the tongue can do. The tongue can't do what the nose can do. The hands can't do what the feet can do. But there's no jealousy, there's no disharmony in the physical body. All of these different members of the physical body work in harm, harmony with each other to contribute to the functioning of the body as a whole. And even so, in the spiritual body of Christ, there are different members with different abilities, different functions. One member may not do, be able to do what another can do, but that's okay, just do what you can do. We read of the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. There are many today who argue that, well, I'm just like that one talent man. Well, let me tell you something about the one talent man. He was still required to use what he had, and he didn't do it. And so it's no wonder then that the Lord said in Matthew 25 and 30, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. What is the Lord's estimation of you? Does he consider you to be unprofitable? Lazy? He said to the one talent man, thou wicked and slothful servant. Lazy. We need to be involved in the work of saving souls. The wise man said, he that winneth souls is wise. And it's no wonder. One soul is worth more than the entire world. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. What shall a man be profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? One soul is worth more than the entire world. It's not always convenient to attend every service. It's not always convenient to visit the sick, to encourage the weak and unfaithful. It's not always convenient to reach out to someone and talk with them about spiritual matters, to discuss their, their soul's condition with them. But my friends, listen to me. If we make it to heaven, it will not be because of convenience. It will be because of conviction. And so then, do you pass or fail? As I mentioned at the beginning of our study, the good thing is if you fail in all of these things or one of them or two of them, you can do something about it. You can do something about it right now. Come judgment day, it's going to be too late. You can't go back and change anything. Your destiny will be forever sealed. But now you have an opportunity. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 and 2, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You can do something about it right now. So if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to obey the gospel of Christ. Again, Jesus says in Mark 16 and 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. If you're an erring child of God, you need to... Uh, repent of whatever sin or sins has separated you from God. And pray God, asking His forgiveness. Confess your sins as publicly as they've been committed. And it may be that you don't need to publicly respond to the Lord's invitation. It may be that in any one of these matters, it's a private matter. and It's just between you and the Lord. He's the only one who really knows. And take care of it with Him. 
Make changes. Make the changes that are necessary. Make them today. Do you pass or fail?